This is Sci-Fi Episode 60 for August 28th, 2012. everyone, and welcome to SciBite, Jupiter Broadcasting's weekly science podcast, fresh every Wednesday morning over at jupiterbroadcasting.com, and live Tuesday evenings at 7.30 p.m. Pacific at jblive.tv. My name is Chris, and joining us like every week is our host, Heather. Hey there, Heather. Hey there, Chris. Hey, Heather. Happy science to you. Happy science. What are we talking about this week? Today, we're going to take a look at the life of Neil Armstrong, dinosaurs at NASA, musical training, an update on a Hubble contest, curiosity update, and as always, take a peek back in history and up in the sky this week. I love it. Every week, it's my chance to get my science update. Well, all right. What do you say we get into our first news story? All right, Heather, what is the first story we're talking about today? So Neil Armstrong, first man on the moon, he passed away this last week. Yeah, on Saturday. Yes. Yep, I was doing something and somebody brought it up and I was just like staring uh, at my computer and my husband's like, are you okay? I was like, give me a minute. Yeah, it's sad. Uh, I found out, uh, it's wild. I found out on Twitter. I was just happened to be oh, on yeah. Twitter and I saw it and uh, yeah, I just was like, I just stood at my, I just looked at my timeline for a second. I was like, no. Yeah, I know. It's one of those things where you're like, for a minute I was like. Are, are you serious? Or is this just like a, a, a mistype or a misprint? And for a while on Twitter, yeah. it was like yeah. Neil Armstrong, you know, top of the top of the chart about what everybody's saying. Yeah. Yeah. Well, did you actually see that their first tweet was uh, Neil Young? I'm oh, not, yeah. I'm not kidding. Their first tweet, because they were doing so fast and they they redacted it and immediately mm. reposted as Neil Armstrong. They 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 just made a mistake. Yeah. Um, but uh, yeah, honestly, one of the greatest heroes uh, that we've that we've had in our lifetimes. Yeah. I mean, he he was he really was uh, a hero, and he was very private about it. Mm-hmm. You know, he you know he's if the people came up and he did a couple of interviews, he was very personable. He went up and he did a lot of uh, government type level work where he'd go and he'd talk to you know talk about how the how good space is and exploration right. and going to the moon. But like random interviews, right. he wasn't quite into it. I he, guess he was known for attending engineering conferences and things like yes. that too. Yeah, he he was uh, quoted as saying, uh, you know, he's, you know, he views himself as an engineer. Was it? I am and ever will be a White Sox pocket protecting nerdy engineer. <laughs> That's awesome. So he, he did feel himself like that. I mean, he was, and it's kind of funny because the news coverage because of various things going on has been it, it kind of flighty. It wasn't a lot and it kind of passed by really quick. Mm. But yeah, yeah, with the politics seasons and all. Well, you know, I'm in the storm, but comparative, mm-hmm. like mm-hmm. say when, you know, Michael Jackson or, you know, somebody like that, it takes over everything. You can't like go anywhere without it being shouted at you. But the fact that it was more low key, it, I think he would have preferred it more be low key like this. That's interesting. I mean, you know, he he was just that way. You know, he's you know, he viewed himself as not so much the hero as everybody else thought it was. You know, his his view was I was doing my job. I, it was a roll of a dice that it was me, people. Yeah. <laughs> you know, and he I you mean, know, he worked but, hard. There were a group of people there that really worked hard and really trained. At, at the end of the day, though, it does take a certain amount of stuff to sit on top of you know, this huge metal oh, cylinder yeah. of the most explosive fuel man could pack oh, into the yeah. small no. space possible. Oh, incredible. Uh, yeah, the the role of the dice was between all those Apollo astronauts. Yeah, I mean, it still takes some the, stuff, the, though. I mean, the, it, the Gemini know. Apollo, that whole group right there was, all right, we're going to sit on top of a giant rockety bomb. You know, one of the things that uh, has always struck me about Neil Armstrong, and it's not really anything anybody's ever pointed out to me before, but... Mm-hmm. Um, you know, after he passed away, uh, a lot of people started posting YouTube links. And one of the links that was posted was uh, the, the fully matched up audio and video landing on the moon where, uh, you know, we, a lot of people have never really seen the two clips at the same exact time where he's, yeah. you usually either hear or see them apart. And 
uh, you know, things weren't going like according exactly to plan at that moment. Oh no! Uh, but uh, both of them just remained really, really together during that entire yeah. process. I mean, absolute professionals, and and they handled it, you know, and and you know, you 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 hear the smile in their lips when they're when they when they when they radio back to the base. But you know, it's like now on to the next task. We're you know we're oh, here yeah. to do this job and. I just Literally had, a lot had of so many hours. That. Right. You know, they, they had a limited time frame there. I mean, they went, I mean, Neil Armstrong himself thought, you know, there's a 90% chance that they'd be able to get back to Earth safe, but only 50-50, they'd actually be able to land. Mm. You know, and, you know, Neil Armstrong, uh, you know, Buzz Aldrin, Michael Collins, all of the guys that were there, they all felt like it's in some way or another, there was a 50-50 chance that it would be a complete success. So they pretty much walked into it going, you know what? There's a fairly decent chance. I don't think I'm coming back. Yeah, the other thing that's kind of funny, and it sort of plays into uh, Neil's uh, modesty, is mm-hmm. uh, in most cases, he's the one taking all the photos. Yeah. So he's not really in most of the photos. Yeah. And, you know, some people have, there's the rumor that goes up that, you know, it's always the second in command that, you know, goes down and did he pull rank and no, it had everything to do with where the hatch was. The hatch was near, the only other way that Buzz, um, you know, Buzz could have gotten out first was if he crawled over Neil Armstrong. Mm. It was like, no, he's by the door. Okay, let, let me get out that way. You know, so he got out and then Buzz Aldrin uh, was able to get out. So it was kind of that way, but it's kind of interesting because I never really even heard anybody make a stink about that, but I never thought about it. It makes sense. Yeah, well, you know, some of the see the the realms I go about the stinks is kind of different from the realms of like normal society. It's an interesting people. one though. No, it's a very interesting one. Yeah, and so I have heard that. But yeah. uh-huh. you know, there are so many different things about it. He did it took so much guts, and he was such a driven person. He got his license to fly before he had a driver's license. <laughs> I mean, this was an Eagle Scout. You know, he worked hard, and he was really good. You know, at what he did, he was a test pilot. He flew more than two hundred kinds of, you know, aircraft from wow. gliders to jets for NASA. And he was in the the Gemini program. He actually was able to. Uh, he was part of the program that docked. That did the first docking of two spacecraft in orbit. So, right, right. And there was some problems with that, and he kind of had to come back from that because there's there were a lot of sort of almost terrible things happening, you know, in those early days. Yeah, because it, it, we we at our comfy 2012 perspective take for granted yeah. what kind of tools they were working with. Yeah, I mean, I've heard it before. It's like. If we had to function under the kind of safety, you know, <laughs> that we have today, there's no way we could have got it. I mean, let's face it. These guys, you know, gave themselves, you know, 50-50 chances, 90% chances that it would actually, you know, everything would work. There's no way that could be accepted in today. These were just crazy, crazy test pilots. And I think that's in why a pe- time people in our they- generation almost uh, find it more awe-inspiring. Yeah. And... You know, to me, even granted all that, he's a very much a symbol. You know, it was you know, thousands of people, thousands of other engineers went in and all these people came together to put these guys out there, you know, to train them, to get all the pieces together and get them there. And then there he was. And it's this sort of moment that, you know, it's, it all came together. I mean... Was it 600 million people, a fifth of the world's entire population, watched it or listened to it? Well, and how many people have watched it since then? I mean, just, well, yeah. yeah. I mean, at, at the time, like one of every five people in the entire world yeah. was well, watching or listening. And that's like including people that really, you know, a lot of places that don't have radios, mm-hmm. people that are having to, you know, maybe they had to work and be somewhere. I think it was, I think, I think part of, I think the, the, the impression that made around the world will never yeah. be fully quantified, but I, I think it was invaluable. Oh, incredibly so. Uh, was it Neil Armstrong said uh, that it was the ultimate peaceful competition that was USA versus the USSR and allowed them to take sides and with objections being science and learning and exploration. 
you know, there was a competition, you know, of the space race, but it was a competition, a heated competition in, you know, reaching out in, in scientific expor- exploration. So it was kind of a, a very different type of competition there. Hmm. Wow. And I mean, it's kind of funny during the event, you're talking like all these people are, you know, listening. There was such a fervor in his hometown. Like they, you know, everyone can congealed get on top of his parents' house. I mean, people were ripping the grass out of the yard. Right. Be like, I have grass from Neil Armstrong's <laughs> yard. Shaking it about. Oh. They're like, okay, that's last week's grass clippings. No, it's Neil Armstrong's grass clippings. Yeah. Uh, silly people. You know, and there was, there have been a lot of people that, you know, talk about it. You know, Buzz Aldrin, Michael Collins, you know, administrators, the president, and it goes on and on. Um, uh, Friday, this upcoming Friday, the August 31st, is going to be when his family holds their private um, ceremony. Mm. And that's when uh, uh, President Obama said all flo- flags will be flown at half staff and kind of uh, in memory mm-hmm. of, of that event and, you know, of him. That's nice. and, yeah. I mean, it all, all of it coming to be, I mean, we talked about the, you know, the event, um, the anniversary of it not so long ago. Yeah, the uh, the Apollo landing, yeah. Yeah, the Apollo landing. And, you know, you, you have that fresh on your mind and you're going forward and then suddenly this is, is there, it was like, it's one of those things that you like imagine it is there. It is this epic moment in human history that we have stepped beyond earth, you know, and we see somebody, you know, standing on the surface of another world, looking back at earth. And it's, it's kind of awe-inspiring. He, you know, he said it was beyond any other visual experience he'd ever discovered, like exposed to. And one of the things that was kind of weird as I looked through this all is that he said he'd never had a dream about being on the moon. He never dreamed about it after it happened. Oh, wow. It's kind of, I was like, whoa, like you're there and you do it and then there's no dream. I guess like in your brain, it's like, yeah, that's pretty much the pinnacle of dream. There, there's really no messing with that. Yeah, you know, just just leave that in the corner of the the awesome of the awesome. I'd be like, send me back it's, there. I want to go back. I know that's what I think you do. <laughs> Only this time, no suit. <laughs> yeah, well, you know, and, and not the the terrible side effects of that. Right, but I mean, he was. You know, but he was not in the the public image. You know, very often it was Buzz Aldrin. He does a lot of public appearances, a lot of interviews. And, right. you know, that's really, you know, and it's good to have somebody very, you know, there and visceral. But Neil Armstrong was very modest. He was more of the, uh, I'm an engineer. Engineers are awesome. He went and he was, uh, and he stepped down from NASA. Once he got back, he's like, I'm never going to space again. Mm. That That was my last flight. End of story. And then he ended up going back and, you know, teaching and running a farm. Mm-hmm. You know, and he'd do the occasional, you know, show up in for these uh, congressional hearings, for various hearings or conferences and things. But anything really large, he would generally keep his, you know, keep his um, his speech to a minimum. Hmm. You know, one, one of them was, you know, he essentially hopped up on stage. and He's like, wow, it's been 35 years. Huh. And like trump trump and there he goes off. <laughs> it was just a very like two sentences and he's he's like okay. Yeah. He I mean he went he really went into it going I don't want to to capitalize on this too much. I want to maintain my privacy. Hmm. He said he looked back at um Lindbergh and saw how crazy um all that could get. He's like, "You know, you know what? You know, kind of a stand post of what he thought would happen. So he just decided, he's like, you know what? I, I take pride in, you know, engineering, you know, I, it's, as he said, um, in my own view, the important achievement of Apollo was a demonstration that humanity is not forever chained to this planet and our vision to go further than that. And our opportunities are unlimited. It was, it, it really was more this idea and this stand post, you know, what, what he stood for. And he will continue to stand for, and for, for as long as there is, everyone will, will look at this. And so many people into the future will, will watch a little clip 
you know, one small step for a man, and he, you know, hops down, you know, onto the lander and then puts his foot down on the, on the ground of another planet. You know, and there's, there's so much to that. And as his family, you know, is essentially said, you know, in, you know, take his example, service, accomplishment, modesty, and, you know, said, look up at the move, look up at the moon, you know, give him a wink. <laughs> And, you know, just saying, you know, donate to, you know, specific charities that the, that they had picked out. But it was all very much kind of that stance is that his whole life was, I'm doing my job. He was an engineer. He was proud to work hard in those, you know, in that way. And like you said, he was so calm. I mean, when they were, you know, everyone knows about, you know, 15, 15, you know, 20 seconds left of fuel. Mm -hmm. And they have to come down, like, vertically. Like, almost vertically, or it'll have a good chance to tip over. And once they started getting down lower, all the dust starts flying up. And there's, the windows are completely blocked. So, there's, like, no frame of reference, really. You can't really feel, you know, you're like, I feel down is this way. Because the moon is, like, one-sixth gravity. Right. And with everything else going on, you know, it's kind of hard. So he was using, he could see the thruster, um, you know, jets coming through the window. So he used that to kind of make sure that they were going straight down. Clever. And it's kind of weird. They may have had only seconds, you know, so many seconds of fuel left, but they landed so gently. It was, you know, they were going down at the speed of an elevator. They landed so gently that they both kind of sat there and like, are we down? <laughs> They're like, yeah, I think we're down. Soft landing. Shut, you know, you know, they kind of sat there for a minute. They're like, <clears throat> okay, we're down. Cut the engine. <laughs> <laughs> Did we fall? Nope, we didn't fall. We must be down. <laughs> yeah, that's what he said in, uh, you know, in, in one of his uh, interviews or biography that you know, they were, they're like, all right, we're either down or so close. It's going to be okay if we drop right. just a little because yeah. it's one six gravity. We'll be safe. Right. That's the advantage of having a, a soft floor and a, a low gravity. Yes, so nice and gentle. It it's kind of funny. I'm having I'm having these moments where I was it was a really blow to me right at first. Like it yeah, was yeah. like this whole like chunk of my mind was just like, all right, we're going to turn off for a little while. We'll get back to you. <laughs> and then started, you know, moving again. And by now it's sort of I've, you know, been reading all these articles and I kind of swing from like almost joy of you know celebrating his life and all everything that it meant to still going back and going oh, wait a minute yeah and it, it's kind of it's interesting that it's all going to have this all went together i mean he was 82 but there were only there are a limited number of people who actually walked on the moon this is the thing you know it's it's kind of as we go forward you know how many where does that number lie? And him most specifically, because he, everyone knows, you know, that name. People all over the world know that name. People all over the world have seen that clip, have heard those words, and they will for all time. I mean, you know, in, you know, future Cybite renovation, you know, 2,300,000. And they will still be like, hey, Watch this clip of Neil Armstrong. Everybody, I know you've seen it. And you'll see it again. It's still epic I, every time. Yeah. It, it, it's that representation of this is when we, we stepped out, off of Earth. And it was it, really amazing that, and for me, that he really considered himself an engineer because I can kind of, there are so many engineers that really, I'm not in, you know, in specific case, but I kind of connect with that feeling. Mm-hmm. You know, it's like we're all, you know, all sorts of people and scientists and engineers are sitting there and they can go about it and they go, this guy was like that. You know, he could be, you know, so many different people. You know, some, like you can relate to like somebody you know. You're like, oh my gosh, the engineer, over, you know, doing that work over there. Like, they, they can feel they have that, a lot of the same mentality somewhat. You know, and he, he wasn't. Oddly enough, it kind of uh, was weird, but he said, you know, he wasn't 
like exercising a whole lot. Like he kept in shape, but he wasn't like, you know, militarily crazy about it. Mm -hmm. He's like, I'll keep in shape. But he's like, I, you know, he said, you only have so many heartbeats. (laughs) (laughs) I I kind of read that and for him specifically, because it was complications from uh, cardiac surgery. And it was, is that kind of hit me very, very oddly. Interesting. But, That's interesting. You know, well, I mean, maybe if he had, you know, been better in shape, he would have been, mm-hmm. you know, better off. But the 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 whole idea is, you know, w- what he stood for in his life and his humility and everything he did, and it's amazing what function of so many people's lives, you know, have that as a staple. It's like man on the moon. There you go. And for me, it's, it's with such a chunk, like, there we go. That is my life. That is, that is a stand post. Mm-hmm. And then it just, it's not that it doesn't go away. Is it I, um, you know, something that I tweeted, and it was just like the moon doesn't quite look the same. But it's, I mean, it's still the moon. It is still as awesome. Armstrong was there. But it kind, it kind of, for a moment, it looked different. Maybe one or two steps further away. Yeah, just like, huh. So, kind of, sometimes these stories come up where it's kind of a little bit of a downer, but he he really deserves to be talked about and all the different things, you know, that he did. And there's there's so much info, you know, in, in the show notes and all the sort of links that are there about, you know, various people who t- talked about him. And all the various, you know, ins and outs of little bits and pieces of, you know, what he did and all this type of things. I mean, so, I mean, even back in the day, you know, his little, you know, they did, you know, the big ticker tape parades in New York and Chicago. And he had his homecoming and little Wapakoneta, <laughs> or whatever the name is. It was like 50,000 people to a city of 9,000. Um. Yeah, the... It was these swarmed up. Oh, you know? yeah. So, so much of it was, was there. And he could have essentially had groupies following him his entire life. Oh, he could have milked it. Oh, yeah. And he just decided, you know what? I would have. Shoot. <laughs> I, I had my life. I'm awesome. Yeah. I'm going to go over here and teach and hang out on my farm. <laughs> it's not unusual for the, uh, for the engineer to sort of. Yeah. Well, Shy away it, from a crowd. Yeah. And some of these guys were, you know, some. it kind of goes both ways. So many of these early, you know, Apollo program people were very, you know, stand in, you know, the, the front, be very open about what's going on or sort of make sure they're like, no, I'm going to take a step back. You know, some of them were just because that where they were, that's the way they were. Or, you know, there was, you know, some of them, their family members didn't like to be in the spotlight, so they stepped back. Mm. In consideration, you know what, like, I, I don't want, you know, wife and kids don't want to be in the spotlight, so I'll step back here with them, you know. Hey, guys, good job. I'll, I'll come out when you need me. Mm-hmm. So just all the hard work and the modesty and the humility that he had and the representation that he was. And what he accomplished, he uh, will always remain accomplished and we'll always look at that. Oh, yes. His um, name will forever be yeah. remembered and put to... Out of out of all of humanity, his there will are, be yeah, his will be one know, of the always remembered. Yeah, there are those handful of people that make some huge dent, you know, some huge accomplishment in the human spectra. That he is definitely one of those. Mm-hmm. Yeah, absolutely. And and if you think about it in that in that regard, and you think about it, that's not even that's not even hyperbole. Right, no, that's it's not, not even exaggeration. If you think about it in that no. context, even though I didn't know him, I didn't even get to meet him. I still well, feel no. somewhat privileged to have existed in the same time frame that he did, because every single future generation mm-hmm. will look back at that, and I will be one of the generations that actually lived at the same time that level of accomplishment was achieved. Yeah, I mean, my, you know, my dad telling me, you know, he remembers, you know, the whole neighborhood gathering around, you know, the people with the TVs. And it's, it's kind of funny. I think talking about that, um, 
Doctor Who. Now, one of the episodes, you know, he embeds some warning into that Apollo 11 clip. Because he says, you know, it's some sort of subliminal message. He's like, because you know what? All of humanity in all time will some point in their lives watch that. <laughs> it's like the best place I can put something. Mm-hmm. And, and that's true. It's like one of those moments like, yep. So that's why watch- I need to watch that show. That sounds awesome. <laughs> <laughs> It's it's one of those asides that this is kind of randomly stuck in my brain yeah. that you know sci-fi no matter what they're everyone's like you know what twenty seconds of video mm-hmm. and and voice connected to a name yep for well, all time and and this struck me is uh, you know we mentioned briefly about how uh, there's only so many people that have ever walked on the moon and there's becoming fewer of them and that's mm-hmm. sad um, and you know he he inspired a generation at a level that you know. Uh, is just in- an incredible. Oh, however, yeah. however, th- the internet has made any of this available to any student anywhere that has an internet connection at any time. And so w- that accomplishment now isn't going to fade away because it's getting older. It's actually going to be discovered at a higher and greater rate than it's ever been discovered in the history of the world. And it's only going to be seen more and more and more. Uh, oh yeah. It, you know, when I was when I was a kid in school, I couldn't just call up the moon landing anytime I wanted to. That was impossible. Oh, no. That didn't exist. Oh, yeah. You know, now if my son wants to, he can watch it a million times in his lifetime. Oh yeah. So it's pretty cool. Definitely. Yeah. Any other thoughts? No, I think pretty much Neil Armstrong, man on the moon. Next time you're out looking up at the moon, just kinda think about it. Give him a wink. There you go. All right, well, let's uh, let's shake it off, take a quick moment here to talk about something fun. And uh, now I hope many of you got uh, your uh, yourself a toy recently, because if you haven't and you're itching for one, well, Heather and I have a suggestion for you this week. And I can heartily recommend the first, uh, um, uh, first release, Borderlands 1. So I'm assuming Borderlands 2 is going to be mucho excellent. And guess what? It's available for pre-order. Borderlands. Nice. So there's a there's an extra little uh, Benny with uh, this pre-order, isn't there, Heather? Yeah, you get a bonus character, Mechromancer, like mechanical. Mech- it, it's kind of funny. That's, that is funny. Uh, anyway, <laughs> so uh, we don't uh, we don't actually get sponsored from the game directly. Uh, so uh, we don't care what you get as long as you use our affiliate system, like maybe a book on the life of Neil A. Armstrong. Uh, yes. This looks like a good one, Heather. You picked this out. Yes, I did. This was uh, the uh, the author actually did a lot of interviews with Armstrong and reading through all the articles. I was you know read like at least you know fifty to seventy five percent of them at some point quoted that book and quoted an interview that that guy made. Hmm. This looks like a good one to get. It's got uh, ninety eight reviews and four stars. Uh, so uh, the way this works is Jupiter Broadcasting is supported by our audience, and you can use our donation links to contribute directly, or if you want to get yourself something and give us a little something while you're doing that, use our affiliate links at the bottom of the website over at jupiterbroadcasting.com. Uh, or grab one of our browser extensions and our affiliate that support them. In fact, we have more affiliates in our browser extensions that are even listed there on our website, uh, and we're updating the extensions all the time with new ones like uh, perhaps... Monoprice in the near future. You can grab the Chrome or Firefox extension and add those to your browser and then automatically tag your shopping session. And that's just a really great way for our audience to directly support these shows. Keeps the ads to a minimum, which I know you guys appreciate. And uh, we really appreciate it because it's awesome to be funded directly by the people that enjoy the content. So thank you everyone who does that. And you can find links to both Borderlands 2 and uh, First Man, the Life of Neil A. Armstrong. You can find links to those in uh, episode 60 show notes. What do you say, Heather? Should we uh, move right along to the news bite? Ho, 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 ho. Yes. <laughs> what's uh, what's in the news bite, Heather? What do we got? We're still in the topic of NASA, and I kind of lead it, led on to it in the intro. Dinosaurs involved? No, I'm not talking about those poor ancient scientists. Okay, okay, yeah. What did you mean when you said NASA and dinosaurs? Because those two things don't usually go together. Footprints of an ankylosaur have actually been found on the property of NASA Goddard Space Flight Center in Maryland. <laughs> wow, that's a that's a that's an interesting NASA connection. Yes, I mean they're you know some you know heavily armored subgroup you know uh, ankylosaur lacked the the tail club that some of them they had spikes along their side, but at least two 
tracks. Like they're thinking um, a mother and a child because a smaller print was found inside the larger one. And, you know, Aww. lots of little kids run around following following moms. They figure that might be a good Aww. time. And actually, as the time has gone on, there's actually a couple of other sets. They're sort of in the process of being identified. Okay. So it's like, this was a little pathway, you know? Here's a pathway of scientists and engineers. It's NASA's got us Goddard Space Flight Center. Are you telling and me over there's here a trail? The words, it's a trail? There's, well, not like a trail, but like this path of... Yeah. like it might have been a trail back in the day. Yeah, it was probably a trail back in... Yeah. Now, some of them are already begin... Um, the first track is already beginning to ro- erode, oh. possibly damaged by a lawnmower. But all these prints are like 112 million years old. Dinosaurs tromping right through, you know, Space Flight Center. Gosh, that... Is kind of a mind bender. I just I'm yes. gonna process. So the spot where we work on the most advanced stuff that anything going on into the, space, right? Just yep. totally way out there. Used to be the stomping grounds of for some s- dinosaurs. For some dinosaurs. Okay. Well, yep. I guess. Although, if you think about it, probably most places were stomping grounds. Well, right? yeah, a lot of places. A lot but of places. These, these is kind of interesting because these are, these are some obvious active ones. Yeah, obvious active, and you don't get footprints everywhere. They're not going to be. You know, preserved in the right way. Yeah. Just the fact that they're they're here is kind of yeah. The fact they found these footprints is pretty pretty significant. Oh yeah, the footprints themselves, and the fact that it was on NASA grounds kind of adds a, a twist to the whole thing. I mean, yeah. they're moving to <laughs> to protect them and bring in paleontologists to you know cut canvas theory, see if there's any other tracks. Huh. And they're now they have to kind of very carefully look at the laws and regulations because they would like for them to be viewed, but there's specific laws about how you can handle them. And they're on government property. Well, so, so I, I'm pretty sure that adds an extra little uh, twist of following very specific rules and regulations about what happens to them, how it happens, and when it can happen. So, they, so, uh, so, it's, what you're saying is, it's probably not going to get public viewed, pu- public viewings. Not right away. They uh-huh. would like to. The Goddard Space Flight Center would, would has said that they would like to put them on display in some way. But for now, they're. I mean, first step is. Identify, you know, anything in the area, then go to preserve, then, you know, look at, okay, what can we do now that we know where they are? We know that they're safe. Right, right. So now we move forward from there. So, I mean, they, well, of course, you can always, uh, you can always uh, look at them online, I suppose. And Heather has links to them in the show notes. So yep, there's a couple always... of them posted. Yeah. So, and don't try, you know, don't go tromping through government facilities. Besides the fact they have actually, not disclose the location of these. They're, they're keeping that quiet. Oh, ooh. Now, is this a thing, Heather? Is this like a thing people go and raid like uh, these spots or something? Is why are they? What's with all the almost obnoxious level of secrecy? Well, until they're preserved, you don't really want. You just don't want to risk around. it. Yeah. Now, when I was very young, we went to the um, dinosaur, you know, monument. You know, all these, you know, cliff face of of bones and all sorts of tracks. And when we got there, we couldn't go on some of the tours because a handful of people had come up with, you know, with concrete, you know, sledgehammers and stuff and been able and had busted free a couple of the the footprints. <laughs> Put them in a you know and just drove off with them. So there's multiple levels of this. You want to preserve them. Yeah. You don't want to tempt people right give them, you don't want to make you know, it easy come find yeah. them here we don't have anybody guarded just walk up here just yeah we'll sign dinosaur prints here yeah. Ding. I, I checked in on foursquare yeah <laughs> i understand so, so yeah i mean you want to preserve them you want to keep them safe and then you know once all that's happened then you know they'll they'll probably find out some way that they can display them or display you know molds of them or something in whatever way possible, be like, hey, there's dino print, dinosaur prints here on campus. That's awesome. Now, Heather, yes. our, our next story uh, only reinforces the belief that I have that our mm-hmm. brain has special wiring just for music. It doesn't does. It does. So a little musical training in childhood goes a long way in improving how your brain functions. Really? They have actually directly examined what happens after uh, a child stops playing a musical instrument? So they went and they had these these groups, forty five adults, grouped into three, you know, three match sets. 
Um, one of them had no musical instruction. Hmm. Uh, another group had one to five years. Another group had six to 11 years. Oh. And, you know, anything that they started practicing around age nine or so. What they were able to see is that musical training, even it didn't take great amount of years, even as, as few as, you know, two to three years, was able to increase um, the neural processing of sounds later in life. So even short-term musical les lessons gives you lifelong listening and learning. So sort of like um, early bilingual studies have shown, you know, that it increases brainstem responses. It can give you heightened auditory perception uh, function. Because you're so, listening for things, right? Yeah, you're able to listen mm -hmm. better in, like in focusing on a person in a noisy restaurant. So. Oh, wow. You know, and I've. I almost kind of wondered because it specifically said instrumental. Yeah. Now I did a lot of um, the main instrument I played was vocal cords. I sang. Yeah. So I'm pretty sure there's it's kind of the same, but I if it's just auditory or if it's the you know the hand motions to go along with it, huh. you know, physically moving something. But it it actually proves mom and dad right. You really needed to practice some sort of music for a little while <laughs> and the school stuck you in music classes and that actually helped. It helps the way your brain functions, breaking down things in a noisy environment. I don't know much about it, but I guess there was a study that, I don't know, maybe you saw it, that suggested that we actually have special memory capacity for music too that's outside of our standard uh, memory using way. I don't know. I, 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 mean, I didn't, that's... I saw the headline and I read like the first paragraph. I thought, what? And basically what it said is that uh, a review of a current set of literature suggests that music is special in some circumstances, but not others. Series uh, have a uh, series, a series of studies have designed, uh, explained that a cognitive processing of linguistics, linguistic stimuli <clears throat> uh, apply reasonably well. Uh, thus the whether of uh, what the question is, whether memory of music is special remains open but uh, they they say that it strongly suggests that there is a special memory for music. For I don't know anybody else, but for myself specifically, I you know if I'm driving and I have the radio on, I will some suddenly break into a song, and I was like, why am I singing? And I'm singing the song on the radio. I wasn't necessarily listening, but suddenly <laughs> singing that. And you know, my mom told me when I was when I was little, like you know, there'd be a movie, you know, like Annie or something playing in the background, and I'd you know be tromping around with my little. Hot Wheels, and then suddenly I'd break into the song <laughs> in the movie. So it's suddenly like my my brain's like, oh, musical cue, go. You know, whatever else you're thinking. So yeah. it, it makes sense on so many ways if you're... And I've noticed in my kids, like early on, you know, they, they get beats, they get they get music, you know, they they master that before they master regular language, for sure. Yeah, you can, you kind of sing song. It's, it's so many reasons, you know, you... There's a song to the alphabet. So you remember the alphabet. There was a song that I was taught in middle school about the, the 50 states in alphabetical order. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. That's a great way to learn. And, you know, by the time we got to high school. That, see, that there does was, suggest there there's this, different memory for songs. Because, yeah. There was, there was a geography class that, you know, you got a map of the U.S. Yeah. and 50 lines. And you had to put everything in alphabetical order and then label them all. Did you start singing? The entire classroom, you'd hear snippets of the song being hummed <laughs> all over the classroom. The teacher finally gave up. You know, they were trying to like, shh, be quiet. Oh, forget it. They're like, just don't hum too loud or don't hum the whole song. Well, and honestly, this is this is kind of sad. But if I like think of A, B, C, D, E, F, G in my head, I, I every now and then, you know, I go A, B, C, D, E, F, G. You know, I'll do that yeah. kind of. <laughs> yeah, you like start a letter. You're like, oh, I'm going to be okay. <laughs> Yeah. So the song stuff is, yeah, it's, yeah, it's, it's good times. So it, there's, there is some strong memory connections there. And, you know, if you're in, you know, an instrumental, you know, you're in a band or in your choir or something, there's a lot of sounds going on. There are a lot of voices and you have to know where your part is. Yeah. Are you listening to your neighbor? Yeah. You have to know what happens when and not be confused. You have to be able to catch the tune too and then translate that to a tune. Yeah, you know, well, you know, I sing alto and I can't be distracted when sopranos suddenly start singing completely different notes. Uh, you know, you know, you're seeing harmony. You know, you're you're playing an instrument and suddenly the woodwinds go crazy. So you have to be able to filter out all that to find where you are. Uh Sakarumbu in the chat room says uh, when you take a sobriety test from a cop, 
they tell you to recite the alphabet without singing it. That's part of the test. <laughs> that would be interesting. Yeah. Even even sober, you know, it wakes up up in the exactly. middle of the night. Say your alphabet and don't sing it. I could, I'd be like, officer, I, I'm sober and I can't. I couldn't do that. <clears throat> you're like, you're like really concentrating. I'm like sitting here. I'm like, you're gonna look up and be like, A, B. Yeah. Like sing it in your head sing and then try head, to say yeah, it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so you have excuses to make your kids have some musical training and it doesn't, you know, it's, it wasn't, you know, six to 11 years. They said, you know, even two to three years nice. actually, actually did it. They just so, got, I just got to force them to do it for a few years. That's not so bad. No. I mean, a lot of schools will have, you know, some sort of choir for a few years. So. Yeah. Yeah. So there you go. There's good, there's good reason to it. It's part of a well-balanced educational diet. All right, Heather, well then with that done, right. I think it's time we move on to the two bite news. The What? The two by news. This song someday will have lyrics that don't change from week to week. Two by news. <laughs> All right. So, uh, what's the first story in the two by news tonight? All right. I read across this uh, small documentary called "Chasing Atlantis." It's a uh, just sort of a shoestring budget budget uh, by five Canadians. They just kind of drove down to see the last space shuttle launch, Aww. and it's sort of. They were able to get a whole bunch of different interviews while they were on site, go into some of the buildings, and just, you know, really get a hand of a feel for what was going on. Just sort of, you know, their feelings about the whole shuttle legacy and what it meant to them. So how do I watch it? Uh, There is a link to trailer uh, in the show notes, and then they have a Twitter. They're kind of in the process of fitting it. They are just doing it from their own budget. So they're kind of doing it as quick as they can. They have a website. They have a Twitter. So you can kind of watch as things move forward. And if I see, you know, when it comes out or how it comes out, then I'll definitely update everybody. Cool. Uh, Uh, Somebody in the chat room, uh, Nogal, says he thinks they're about halfway through, Ah. which is, I think, roughly what I read, too. Love to see that on Netflix one day or up on YouTube for free. There you go. All right. What next? All right. We have an update. Uh, Back in... April, yeah, I okay. talked about the Hubble's Hidden Treasure Contest. It was, you know, Hubble has all these data sets out there, you know, in online databases. And they said, hey, everybody, come grab some of our data sets and make your own pretty picture. Right. Yeah, we remember talking about this. This is really cool. They put the data online so people could go through it and find stuff. Yep. And they did over, they had over 3,000 submissions. And now they've come out with the winners. Some of them. No kidding. Yep. yep so and it was. You know, different sub, you know, they judge it on different ways. And there was some online votes and it was pretty close. There was one, um, one of the winners that had a, you know, a galaxy and it was very, they made it, uh, pulled one of the pictures out from one of the specific gases. And it's always seen in one flat picture, Mm. but being able to like pull out that specific um, molecule, they're able to really get an idea of where that was. Somebody pieced together, um, there's this huge image and there's, sort, you know, sort of pasted together pictures. It doesn't look like it's completely full, but they really had a lot of respect for that guy because there was no image of that area. He had to go ah. through the data and just like piece together all these different data sets from different instruments to try to paste together this mosaic of this area. Hmm. And they're, they're really... They were like, wow, you did a lot of work. We really, <laughs> really respect that. Because and these people went to all sorts of different, you know, databases and put it together. And, you know, you see it and it kind of gives you an idea that what could be done. And the fact that they were able to do, open this up to the public was, you know, amazing to kind of well, get it's a, a, it's a savings of taxpayer dollars too, because they got people, they got just you know the average citizen to go out there and got do this. Average citizen, yeah. Well, you know, and it's still there. You can still, you know, open up the data and do it for yourself. They have an on, online program where you can download it and you do it with you know Photoshop or hmm. whatever pro- processing program you have. The Gimp. There you go. Yeah, More cool. than a thousand image. They had 3,000 submissions. Over 1,000 of them were fully processed images. Wow. And they've got, uh, you know, the top 10 up there. The website's still, you know, going strong and got some, you know, video of talking about the whole thing. So 
links to that in the show yep. notes. People have actually emailed in and said, where are the show notes? Uh, and I should address this. Go over to jupiterbroadcasting.com and find Cybite episode 60. That's the episode you're listening to right now. And then where the video is of this episode up top, and you'll see like the description down below a little bit. If you scroll down even further, you'll see download links, RSS subscription links, and a little bit further from that, you'll find the show notes. So, yes. Heather, while we're up in the stars, why don't we uh, hop on over to and Mars? Lift off of the Atlas V with curiosity. Touchdown confirmed. We're safe on Mars. That's right. It's time for our curiosity update, isn't it, Heather? Yes, and every week I lift my hands into the air. Yes, it yeah. <laughs> every week. All right, so it's not just me. That's good because you know we don't have no. the video, so I don't know for sure. No. But <laughs> yeah, I- I'm definitely doing that. Okay. All righty. So it got its driver's license this last week. They were able to drive forward, yeah. turn sixty degrees, and go in reverse. So it moved about twenty feet from the spot where it landed. And somebody in the chat room reminded me today. They uploaded a song, which was the first song to be played on another, you know, another uploaded song onto a planet. What? It they was, have a speaker on the thing. Well, they uploaded it. So I'm not quite sure what all happened, but it was Reach for the Stars by musician Will I Am. Like dots in the middle, like words. He, uh, so I he was there. Will I Am was there during the launch at NASA doing interviews and stuff on their internet stream. I don't know if you saw oh, him. Oh, yeah. Yeah, but he was no. There. So he must I've, he must be in tight with NASA. Yeah, or they kind of knew that that was coming. Yeah. I, l- I listened to just a minute or two, well, more like 30 seconds of it, while the <laughs> stream music was going, too. <laughs> Wasn't your and thing, it, Heather? <laughs> yeah, I was like go, listening to it in the background, and I was like, oh, okay, I heard, you know, he's talking about NASA. So it's very, you know, targeted to this program and reaching for the stars yeah. and NASA and such, but... That's interesting, though. I mean, it, I I think it'd be pretty cool if they did actually play it on the uh, on Mars. There you go. That'd be really neat. Playing something on the other planet. All right, Heather. Well, very fascinating. And of course, uh, was, boy, you you didn't say very much, but you've got quite a bit of links in the show notes. People go ch- go check that stuff out. But uh, yes. All right. Now, uh, with that all done, it's time to uh, jump in the time machine. Oh my goodness! Close oh. the door. It is closed. Oh, okay, all right. Sorry, the lights. Ah, here we go. Oh, there we go. Sorry, the light was stuck on. I got it. Sorry, the door light. Okay. All right, Heather. So, uh, sorry, didn't mean to get us all worked up there. Everything's okay. That was only a 41-year trip. Takes us to August 1971. What happened this year? Or this week, sorry, in science. Neil Armstrong retired from NASA. It's a quick note, very topical to the top of the show. Yeah. So he was, you know, he... Launched a landed from back from Apollo 11. He was promoted to some sort of administrator. And then within a year, he re- retired and moved on to teaching in his farm. Good man. That sounds like so, the way to go. That's what I want to do. When I get yeah. done, I'm going to go retire and live on a farm. Yeah, but uh, but after you like make it. Yeah, oh, yeah, yeah. No, I got make years. Your name I known got to, ye- for all time. I got at my current rate, I should be ready to do that in 2170. So, okay. Yeah. Uh, yeah that meantime, sounds about right. In the meantime, though, I have this flashing button. I should. Ah, oh, oh. it's time to look up into the sky this week. Right. August 29th. We got the planet Mars low in the um, in the west southwest as just as night falls. Hmm. It's still forming the triangle, but now it's kind of a smooshed triangle <laughs> um, with Saturn and Spica. Uh, August 31st on Friday, just before sunrise, to the east-northeast, you might be able to spot Mercury and the bright star Regulus just below it. So there'll be a little star. It's not that bright. And then Regulus right below it. Uh, Also, it's a full moon on Friday. So it'll be the second full moon in the month of August, which colloquially in folklore is called the blue moon. Ah, yes. So. Yes. Yep, we'll have the blue moon, and just after dusk, so we've gone before sunrise, and now we're all the way to dusk, you're going to see Mars and Saturn team up uh, again, low in the western sky, early evening, you have Mars to the left, Saturn to the right. And actually, if you have a pair of binoculars or a small telescope, if you look at Saturn, you'll actually be able to see Titan, its, uh, its large moon. Wow, cool. If you look at Saturn, uh, you can actually you know you see its rings. Now, it tilts. The rings tilt every so many years. So 
you know, it goes from being able to have a really good view of the rings to them being kind of more of a line. But right now, it's a pretty good view of the rings. Ooh. So you can actually see those. With binoculars? Uh, yes. Oh, cool. Now, it's, you know, they're not really, you know, big. You know, my main memory is through my telescope. Mm-hmm. And then it's, you know, pretty apparent. But... You can still see him. Uh, you can at the very least see its moon, Titan. Yeah. Uh, this week, Venus is about up about uh, two hours before dawn in the east northeast. Uh, by dawn, it's more higher in the eastern sky. Jupiter this week is hanging out around midnight, rise in the east northeast. Will be a orange star, Aldebaran, to the right or lower right of it, depending on what time of the week you're looking at it. But reason to bring that up is. Not Mars. By dawn, Jupiter is pretty much in the upper southwest. This week, you know, as we've talked about a couple times, we have Mars, Saturn, and Spica. They're, they've been in a nice triangle. Now it's being stretched out. So kind of as we move forward, they'll get farther and farther apart. So, but they're still there and still visible. They're still buds. Yep. They drift apart, but they, they still email each other. Yep, they, they email each other. They'll... <laughs> They, they stay in contact. They, they follow each other on Twitter. Exactly. Exactly. Uh, Heather, I think, that's, I think that brings it to the end of the show, yeah? I think so. All right. Now, uh, Heather, where can people find you on Twitter? You mentioned that earlier in the show. Where, where is that? I am JB underscore Mars underscore base. There you go. And of course, I am Chris LAS on Twitter. Now, uh, SideBite is live on seven th- at 7.30 p.m. Pacific over at JBLive.tv. And we invite you to join us live because we have our chat room up on the screen when we're not showing a visual. And it's always good to get your extra conversation in there and get your chat on the internet. But uh, all right, Heather, well, thanks for another great episode of SciBite. Thank you. All right, everyone. Well, and thank you very much for tuning in this week's episode of SciBite. We'll see you right back here next week.